damn song for the Gear Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We're here. We're back <laughs> with another episode of the Gear Podcast, and uh, we've been waiting for this one for quite a while. He needs no introduction. We got Mr. Michael Nielsen on the show. How hey. are you, Michael? I'm great. Cheers, guys. Cheers. I got a brand new coffee here. Uh, so, yeah, raise your glass. Everybody. So, for anyone unfamiliar with what Michael does, they may know him as somebody who makes very informative, great sounding YouTube videos, but you also, you know, you do music for a living, right? So, your company, Ninja Tracks. Uh, how else would you describe what you do? Um, yeah, it, it rotates. It's a lot of everything, which I think is what everyone does these days like you do everything um so i um i'm a producer engineer composer i i guess i I feel uncomfortable putting composer anywhere closer to the top of that stuff because uh there's guys that have just a completely different relationship with notes that i don't even understand (laughs) so um, my, my relationship comes fr- from, I could write some cool stuff, but it comes from a different angle from guys that I go, I'm comfortable calling you a composer. Um, but yeah, so I have a company called Ninja Tracks that, uh, we specialize in, uh, music for advertising, movie trailers, video game advertising, all that kind of stuff. And then I also write music for, uh, video game scores separately. Like, uh, we, we've done, um, some stuff for League of Legends, uh, Splinter Cell, which was in a big Xbox game at the time. And then more recently, we've done the last three of the um, Forza Motorsport franchises. Awesome. For- so for- it's funny, funny you mentioned League of Legends because I was talking to my wife like two days ago. Uh, we were going to the gym and she's like, oh, I kind of found this playlist with these songs that I really like. And, you know, a lot of them are from this game League of Legends and, uh, you know, I was aware of the game, have, but had never played it, and I knew it was a bit of a thing. And she does cosplay and things like that, so those mm-hmm. kind of things are very popular. So that's kind of wild to think that, yeah, probably some of your stuff was on that playlist because there was some good kind of, you know, like pop and rock stuff on there, just like punchy tunes and yeah, I really the pop and rock stuff is really good, yeah. and it's gotten better and better and better. It's like pretty incredible, high, super high level now. Um, when we were doing it, it was more on the score side. We okay. did; one, they were releasing um, themes for the different uh, characters that you can be. So we did the Udir theme, and that accomp- there was an accompanying uh, like online comic book that we scored. And then that year, they had the like the World Series of League of Legends, and we did like a three-minute opening cinematic for the the championship thing. Uh, so that was that was a cool year to do that stuff. Um, and then we haven't done anything uh, since with them, but um, that team over there is nuts. They're so good. And obviously Forza is like, that's a big thing, like that type of game. It's um, it's like a racing game, right? Yeah, it's it's uh, so Sony has their um, Gran Turismo, and then Microsoft has Forza Motorsports. They're competing like just racing games. Um, and we do the score and... The last uh, version of it, Forza 7, had a bunch of songs, which was really cool to do sort of like garage rocky, bluesy stuff. So I was just buying amps and pedals like every two <laughs> weeks. I'm like, what? It's for work, you know? Mm-hmm. How about this vintage orange and this old, uh, you know, another Fender? I was just like collecting. And then when the game ended, I was still in buying mode and I just started compiling. Like it was, I could feel the stacks of just crap piling up and then i had no outlet for it it's like what am i going to do with all these fuzz pedals like (laughs) no one else lets me use fuzz in their music so yeah well one of my favorite uh you know i'm sure you've watched all the tom holkenberg stuff he put out on youtube i feel like that was kind of one of the first great youtube in the studio series my favorite thing there is still him talking about the mad max soundtrack um and the way he approached like as someone who doesn't play guitar, how he was like, well, how do I get a good stoner rock sound? I think I just get an SG, a fuzz pedal and an orange amp and then I make (laughs) cool noises, you know? And Yeah, I remember that one. I I remember watching and just going like, that's actually so much more in tune with uh, the concept of play and playing a guitar than what so many of us as like, you know, we're like serious guitar players do. Uh, So I I really enjoyed that. And yeah, just... 
the the use of fuzz. I mean, that's a whole fuzz is its own kind of universe of gear nerdum, isn't it? It oh, I think so. Um I love fuzz and like rooty stuff. I never do it on I rarely do it on my channel and because I kind of started the channel as this sort of like rack 80s yeah. racks and 90s racks and rack gear. Um so then I think whenever I do like a fuzz thing people are like what is that? Like it just kind of uh the core audience is not into that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Is that something but you find? Like Cuz I know I mean one of my favorite kind of blues uh, I don't know if you call them roots, but definitely kind of modern blues artist is Philip Sace, who you've worked with, right? Yes, yes. Uh, so that's where, you know, I've been a producer too, you know, like I've been at this since I was 19. So I was producing pop music. Like I, I did um, the, uh, I'm to, it's, I told you, it's late for me, so I'm, I'm spacing <laughs> on the, the, the names. Um, but I did uh, some music with Selena Gomez before she became a teacher. Huge Selena Gomez. It's awesome. Um, but a lot of the like Disney girl pop stuff in this era, we were we were working on that stuff. Wow. And then I, I got to the point where I was like, this is it. I can no longer I'm gonna drive my car off this bridge if I have to ruin one more song with a girl that can't sing that because she has a TV show. Right. You know, <clears throat> so um then I started writing a buddy of mine was doing movie trailers and I'm like, well, let me just try something like that. And a lot of times I would get feedback on my music where they're like, uh, it's t it makes me feel like Top Gun or something like that. <laughs> yeah. I was like, uh, yeah. You're welcome. Because it's awesome. <laughs> and <laughs> so it really was it, like, also the other feedback that I had sometimes was that, you know, it, a lot pop music should feature, it should be the vocalist. That's number one, especially in like non-rock, non-band oriented stuff. It's got to be the vocalist. And I would just produce the shit around the vocalist to where the vocalist would just be like, who cares about the vocalist? Like, they're way back there. But when they're paying for the production, uh, they're like, why'd you throw me all the way in the back? Mm -hmm. But it was really because I liked the instrumental stuff so much better. And I find that much more interesting than uh, recording vocals, really, and, and doing vocal music. Uh, so that's how I ended up sort of shifting over to scoring. Uh, but... I just lucked upon meeting Philip Sace um, where our studio was. He had come to town and a friend put us together. And uh, I think I, uh, the, the moment for me was, um, I don't know if you guys, do you know Ian Moore, the artist? Oh, no, okay, that's, so he's, that's a new name to me. Okay, so he's an Austin-based uh, guitar player. Amazing. I'll send you guys some links. That's like, he's incredible. And it was the time when like, C.V. Ray had passed away and Kenny Wayne Shepard was pretty big mm -hmm. and there was other guys that were sort of like shooting for that new spot that was this huge gap that was left open by C.V. Ray. Uh, so this guy Ian Moore I mentioned and he's like, how do you know Ian Moore? And <laughs> uh, Jeff Healy and he was like, how do you know Jeff Healy? Like I play with Jeff Healy. That's right. And Jeff was one of the reasons I, I just like got so inspired to play guitar in the first place. So, um, yeah, we just hit it off like crazy, and I've learned so much from him. And, and I think we just have a really cool relationship. Like, I just bring this whole other side of production to his, like, just hardcore, fiery blue stuff. So we, we have a blast when we're together. At Dallas Guitar Festival, I think 2019, I happened to be in the States, and it was like, oh, ah. my, well, my wife's family is from Dallas, so we were visiting, and I uh, just happened to be there, and I was like, oh, the guitar festival's on, I'm going to go down. And, um, yeah, like, as I got there, I heard this guy on the stage kind of ripping, and I walked out, and it was just like, it took me two minutes to realize what was going on, but I was like, who the fuck is this guy? He's got it. Like, it's just oozing charisma and his guitar playing and tone is insane and he's singing i was like oh this is philip sace of course it is like he, <laughs> he played a song that i recognize i was like i knew it was good but i didn't know it was like this level of you know he just had it i don't even think anyone's captured what he does live i don't know if it's possible it's one of those things where you know there's just certain bands that they have so much energy live and the dynamics are so big and the interaction with the audience is a whole part of the show. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just like, and his playing unplugged 
it's amazing to hear. It was the first time when I met someone that they could play so well that unplugged, you're like, oh, it still sounds exactly the same. Yeah, not hiding behind like, distortion and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it just did not matter what you plugged into. It was, it was still amazing. It was like a thing, you know, the core clientele of that entire festival was mostly like middle-aged dudes because, you know, that's guitar. But even <laughs> to that setting, it was like, it, it was like his whole performance was like, it had this like sexiness about it, which you just don't get <clears throat> those kind of things. And you were like, yeah, this is something that, you know, you would here in Australia, the whole like, I guess we didn't really get the sort of like b blues thing. We got more of like a roots thing that's really, really popular. So it's like, mm. you know, guys who like to go and surf a bit and wear rug boots to the shops um, and play a bit of acoustic guitar, like that style of like, you know, more you like, uh, like Xavier Rudd, Jack Johnson, that kind of stuff was really, really popular mm. in the 2000s. So ah. you, you don't really get the kind of like pure electric blues thing, but it was like, you, I could see him working with that kind of crowd here. Like you get a lot of those festivals in the sort of regional towns and the surfing towns. And it was just, yeah, it was just, you just know sometimes. And I'm sure you've had a lot of experiences with that, um, which is my segue to, uh, you know, you're also someone who's worked with like, you know, top tier rock stars, like for example, John Sykes. So um, yeah. So was that, that was there? so weird how I connected with Sykes. Um, we had been working with the Baja men, the who let the dogs out. Guys. Yeah, no oh, right. So like they had just, they literally came from the Grammys and then came to our studio that night and we're like, cool, we're going to work with you. And we're uh, my production team. We're like, this is going to be amazing. <laughs> and then we'll have a huge hit and we'll be, you know, we'll take off. And then of course there, they were one hit wonder. And, you know, we did the album after. And it was just, <laughs> Didn't, didn't that was 2002, out. is that right? 2003? That is right around there, yeah. Yep. Right yeah. around there. And it's Sorry. funny because I'll still, I'll go to Disneyland and be at Disneyland and be like, oh, that's us. That's our, that's our oh, song no. and this is our, so I hear some of that stuff there, uh, which is, is fun. But um, the Baja Men's tour manager, kind of manager, tour manager, was also John Sykes's tour manager. So... When I found that, I was like, dude, like, I got to meet him. And he's like, you might, it's like, it's not really that kind of party where you just <laughs> call up John Sykes and you go meet him. He's not, he's this very friendly guy, but it's more like you'd expect, you know, I wouldn't expect to be able to call up David Coverdale and just <laughs> get an audience with David Coverdale. Like, yep. you know, it's they're royalty kind of level yep. guys. So, um, it took about three or four years. And at one point, I, I, he, there was a lot of talk. And they're like, cool, you're going to produce his next album. And I was like, oh, my <laughs> God, this is amazing. And I was so, so this is how green I was. Uh, it was like way back to Harmony Central. Do you remember mm. the Harmony Central? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Yep. So I was like deep in that. And I was post. I was like, hey, I think I'm going to produce the next John Sykes album. Like, this. And then I get a call like, what are you doing talking like, <laughs> about J John Sykes? I was like, oh, I guess I can't. That's right. You don't, you don't do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, um, Sykes was going to go out on the road, which he hadn't done, I think, in a decade or something like that, and wanted to record a live album with it. And uh, he got Tommy Aldridge on drums, which there was this big drama of that. Like, we're... I think like at the airport and he's talking to Coverdale and Coverdale from what I got, you know, like, rah, 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 rah. <laughs> and after this is, you know, what I hear, um, Coverdale's like, if you don't do this tour, this Japanese tour, like you're no longer going to come play. You can't just do white snake songs in book in a, basically like a cover band and then come and do it in the band too. Mm -hmm. So he ended up going and then I saw him, with white snake later. So I guess it, was, it worked out. It all worked out. Um, but yeah, it was, it was Tommy Aldridge. Um, Derek Sherinian. Wow. Uh, so they had pulled, they had this keyboard player and he showed up for the rehearsals and was bucket of sweat. <laughs> like, like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Cause he had like less than a week to learn the songs. Mm. And 
it's not like they're dream theater songs <clears throat> that are like brutal, but he just was not ready. Um, he was not at that level. I could, I sympathize. Um, <laughs> so he was out and they needed to get a keyboard player quick that could learn all the stuff super fast. So, um, I believe they traded Sykes played on his album and then he played right. on this. I'm pretty sure I, I bought that album because it was like, Oh, John Sykes plays on it. There's also, cause it was another album with like Zach and yes. Niola and Ingve on it as well. So like, well, this is going to be the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> Yeah, I I went over to, uh, this was after we did the Japanese stuff, um, and I'll circle back because there's a couple other stories I'll tell you about that. Um, I would go over to Derek's house, and he'd be like, all right, this is what I want John to do. And like I go over there, and Tony Franklin is there, huh. uh, bass, bass player from Blue Murder. Oh, from, yeah. It's like Ninja. And he's like, oh, I'll tell John hi. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is the best day of my life i go back to john and it's like eh, whatever all right I'm like this is your buddy for blue murder um and so um yeah john would record his so i'd set him up for to record his solo stuff and then he would always record a couple and then i would leave and then he'd record them again and he's like you could edit whatever you want together for that and then Derek was really cool he's like look i know you guys are editing but give me everything i know john yeah, doesn't yeah. want me to have everything but give me everything and i'll put it together uh so he was a cool dude um and then um so going back to that japanese tour sykes had just bought a pro tools rig from some dude so um <laughs> <love> basically <laughs> they're like here's the pro tools rig um we're taking it to japan and you, you'll record it it's like okay great i again green stupidly assumed it was gonna work so we're at the first show. It's all set up and everything is good. I got my session set up and stuff. I hit record. I was also triggering like their the opening song samples and some drum loops and stuff like that. So just, this sounds like my worst nightmare, just quietly. Oh, and so it sounds like you're having to work with Ragdoll Troy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, green, stupid. I, I was triggering drum loop and rhythmic things from like the middle back of the room. Mm -hmm is way out of sync to the drummer. Yep. So Tommy's like, what do you, you got to trigger it on time. I'm like, dude, I have good time. I could tap <laughs> in really good time. Yeah, they can't pick physics, the physics of sound, unfortunately. It's not quite going to happen. It didn't even occur to anyone to be like, I should probably be like right next to you or something like that. Yeah. Anyhow, so that was one, one failure. And then uh, the other failure is I look over and I don't even remember the errors, but it was just like Pro Tools error, Pro Tools error, Pro Tools error. And I got through like two songs with about 20 errors. I just sat, I just sat down. I was like, I'm done. Uh, and that night I got ripped a new one mm -hmm. by uh, John Sykes, my, my hero <laughs> <laughs> in a hotel room. Uh, and, but it was like, I was like, all right, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to stay up all night. I'm going to fix this. And mm -hmm. I did, and it ended up working out. And he was very appreciative, and he was a gentleman. What did you fix? Playing. Like, I don't understand how you fixed anything. If the session, if this, if it crashes, it crashes, right? Yeah, I, I don't even remember now. It was like, un. I think I had to just like de like strip everything way down. I can't remember what was happening. I, going back to the drives, this is so long ago. It was like yep. the. Uh, Buster style scuzzy uh, drives that were just like, yeah, yeah. What year was know, this? Was a mid two thousands as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Early mid two thousands also. Oh man, I just the reliability of Pro Tools at that particular. I'm a massive Pro Tools guy, uh, and I have been for about uh, twenty years, or maybe almost twenty years now. But yeah, that was not a fun time to be a Pro Tools user. It's it no. hasn't been till like five years ago. Now it's like okay, but yeah. It's it was brutal. So man, yeah, you tell that story, I'm just like, oh. My so I was uh well prepared for Pro Tools nightmares, but I was, you know, kind of dumb and thinking I should have done that the week before. Yeah. I should have said, like, give me the rig and I gotta test this yep. over and yeah, over. Yeah, yeah. Um I had went to record an orchestral session for a film score. Mm -hmm. Uh it wasn't my music, it was um 
a friend of our, uh, well, th this composer, Brian Tyler, who uh, was a very good friend of mine in college and stuff. We hit it off like crazy and we had like some small bands together. He ended up going and scoring um, Yellowstone and Fast Furious. Yeah, I know that name. I've, like, I've seen that name yeah, before, yeah. Avengers. I mean, he's he's A-list Hollywood composer. Yep. But, but before he was there, I, like on his way up, I was working with him sort of more in engineering and just whatever needed to be done, capacity, uh, adding guitars on things and stuff. Um, scoring session, very expensive studio. Like, where's the Pro Tools rig? This is when, you know, studios were still taped. So if you needed Pro Tools, uh, you had yeah, to yeah. rent it. Okay. And it came in and there's 50 world-class musicians sitting there with, you know, the sheet music. And a dude walks in and brings four giant plastic bins. And is like, here's the Pro Tools rig. Oh my and god! The producers, directors, everyone's looking at me like we're ready. We're ready to record. Like I have twenty minutes to build the Pro Tools oh rig. My god! And have that ready to go. So that's I've had a lot of those kind of nightmare experiences. And you're on Logic now, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Yes. Now I'm on Logic. Yeah. <laughs> Look. Yeah, I, that that's scary. I can. They just, why would you do everything on Reaper, everybody? It would have been so much easier from the start. Anyway, let's, let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I I missed um, like I, when I started uh, really getting to studio, sort of like 2010 ish. It's like go, coming out of like uni and um, my own Pro Tools setups, which were like 003s and um, that sort of thing. Which even that was like you know the I said the reliability of it was a bit you know hit and miss. Um, but getting into like TDM systems, the studios I was in sort of had that set up and the engineer was like, he knew like the studio owners, like they knew what that was, what was happening with that. I just didn't even touch it. <laughs> I, I just was using the software and kind of getting into it from that perspective. And then I updated my system here about two years ago to go to HD native with the matrix um, studio and all that sort of bullshit. And that was my first kind of like, oh, cool. I'm into Pro Tools like HD land. So Every cable now all of a sudden costs like six times the price of a normal cable. And <laughs> oh. Oh, I can't run YouTube and have a Pro Tools session at the open at the same time. I have to, you're telling me I have to use Dante visual, uh, virtual sound card to Ethernet out of one thing to the other just to, to like watch Michael Nielsen like talk about rack guitars while I try to edit <laughs> drums. It's like, so yeah, it's, it's, they it's still, a commitment. Yeah. It's a real big commitment to use Pro Tools. I, to be honest, the audio and logic is kind of a drag. Like I, um, Leon, what do you use logic? I'm, uh, look, my first rig that I bought, I bought Troy's old Pro Tools rig. So I've just been, it's just uh, once a year, the subscription comes up and I'm like, you know what, Pro Tools, this is it. I'm jumping <laughs> over to something else. And I try to use something else for five minutes and I'm like, no, nah, I'll just pay the 200 bucks or whatever it is for, to, you know, to do what I need to do. But I, <laughs> it's funny you bring up the Pro Tools crashing thing because I recorded some guitars friend of mine does this like operatic metal thing and he's recorded two albums so far and the first one he did he was sort of like okay it's going off to mix now can you and it's a sort of project where it's like all right it's all done congratulations a week later hey can you just fix this one thing uh you know because it was all track it send the di's it went overseas to someone else so it was a bit of a process just to hear stuff back and i tracked everything to like midi everything so i didn't hear it until it came out uh, and it was a sort of thing like oh cool you know can you just bounce stuff out in a slightly different format and i went to open pro tools and there'd been i think my mac had updated and you know classic scenario where it was just like it just wouldn't work so i was like you know what i'm going to download logic uh and just do the free 90 day trial and it worked really, really well. It just took me like two hours to figure out how to just edit a piece of audio uh, mm -hmm. because, again, you know, the best DAW is the one you know how to use. Yeah, that's true. They all do the same yeah, stuff. Totally you know, it's, yeah, I, yeah. It's, it's, it's really converged in that kind of thing. But, yeah, yeah uh, the thing I like about Logic is, you know, you buy a license and you just have it. Yeah, you're done. You're done. You know, yeah. pay, I, buy once, cry once. <laughs> <laughs> I do like the the MIDI on Logic. I'm super happy with that, um, and I'm fine with the mixing. But if if when I'm editing audio and dealing with big sessions it's like Pro Tools, I'm so much faster in copying and pasting. I end up finding that 
um, you know, I was blazing fast on Pro Tools where it was just like zig, 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 zig. and then in Logic, I do a lot of like option drag all of these option and then option drag all yeah, of this. Yeah option drag all of this stuff it's just not the same like pace 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 so you know it, it kind of is what it is at the end of the day like you said it's whatever gets you through i feel know. like pro tools would be like the equivalent of if you were a chef like cooking on the line where you just you just do you know like you, you don't mm -hmm. have any you just want to get these things done quickly whereas like logic is a little bit more like you know, you own a restaurant where, you know, the, it's like the Portlandia chicken episode, right? Where, you know, can we look at it <laughs> yeah. and then like, where did you get this? And, ah, oh, suddenly, ah, oh, have you heard about Reaper? Oh, now I'm in a cult. <laughs> exactly. I, I think it is. It's that thing where you could really conform logic to you. It's a one-person yes. dog. Like yeah, my yeah, right. partner who I, I, my best buddy who I've been with for 20 years writing, uh, together and our, our company partner and stuff. Um, we, for a decade, we sat within about 12 feet of each other. His, my room was one place and his room was right next to it. And when I go into his room, I'm like, how do you, how do you hit play? <laughs> like, how do you record or rewind? It just basics mm -hmm. are not the same. Uh, so I still it, use, yeah. still using right. logic. You mean just like with keyboard shortcuts mm -hmm. and stuff. Oh, mm -hmm. that's, uh, I see. <clears throat> to just it feels totally different it's funny same when he goes in my room i was um my uncle does film post um and has been for a long time but he's a big pyramix user and um oh, okay and i just for this i don't know why i thought of this but a couple of nights ago i thought you know what i don't know what the interface on that looks like even though he's been using it for 20 something years so i just watched a little youtube video i'm like man this is this is what like whack. I don't like this at all, you know, but they did <laughs> the little video I watched. The guy was saying, um, you know, if you're a pro tools user, here's the, um, the thing you can import to basically map all your keyboard shortcuts. So, you know, TNR will zoom in and out, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess that transition makes uh, is a little bit easier, but that's one thing that really, um, I, I think is a real positive about pro tools, because if you go into any studio, um, anywhere, most of the operation is the same. Um, there's a few little quirks that like, you know, it drives me bananas when people don't have the F keys turned on with pro tools because I need to be, I'm like, I'm not a multi-tool user. Uh, I'm just like a, if I want to use, me uh, too. Yeah. I hate the multi-tool. It's the worst. Yeah. Do you know what it was? Another slight sidebar, but like the, um, uh, the guys that I, uh, uh, at the studio that I worked at for a long time, they were like this. They were like, use your F keys depending on the tool you want to use and never touch the mouse. Like if you can, unless you need to, like we all need to use the mouse for certain things, but learn it as a shortcut. It'll save so much time and RSI and whatnot. And so, yeah, that's how I got used to that. And then I, um, you well, know, you definitely got me onto that. You were like, Hey, just learn these shortcuts. And yeah. now I still, I mean, the, it confuses me sometimes when I go from like Pro Tools to video editing. Yeah. Because it's yes, slightly, me too. like I use DaVinci Resolve now and it's like oh, cool. sometimes I'll just be pressing R to zoom out and I'm like, why isn't this working? And it's like scrolling through different tools or something like, ah, oh, wrong, yep. wrong workflow, you dummy. But, <laughs> but that's the thing. It's like Pro Tools system to Pro Tools system. Um, those key things are basically going to be the same. There's a few preferences that you have to change, but. Yeah, the rest of it's usually pretty pretty similar. Whereas, yeah, if you are in that situation of like, oh, here's my logic session or my Cubase session or my Reaper session and everything's completely different, that would drive me bananas. Yeah. <laughs> but that's just me, so. <laughs> yeah. No, I built my, because I came from Pro Tools, I built my logic key commands around Pro Tools key commands. Oh, okay. So, like, I command space for record and, oh, like, I can too. go back to Pro Tools without too much trouble. It's so, uh, sorry, just quickly. Uh, yeah. This is such a silly one, but I, that's how I do it as well. But all my students, because I teach uh, music recording, but they all press th like numpad three or like F12 and, and stuff. Or they still it's so click small. Them. Yeah, just commands. It's your hands always right. there, punching it and out. Space bar, it's like Space so bar is the one. I, I yeah. totally agree. It's so good. Um, you mentioned, so on that tangent of studio stuff, you were, how long you've recently basically sold the studio that you guys built, right? And now you're- Yeah. Oh, can, uh, I can I just say- Can I just say- 13 years ago. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I just want to say, I was shocked when that happened. By oh, the way. That it was so weird. I was like, I, I messaged Lee. I was like, man, like Nielsen's like, what? What's happening? What's I, I don't know what's happening. I was so confused, but yeah, it's sorry to interrupt, but like- Yeah. 
No, it's, it, you know, it was like a COVID thing, really. That was the trigger, I would say, more than anything. Um, but so going back to it, 13 years ago, um, we were, I should go back a little further. We had started our music production company that specialized in movie trailers, uh, Ninja Tracks. And then we had done a, about five years of work or so, and then we ended up... Um, selling that version of the company to Warner Chapel, And we worked for Warner Chapel for a year. And like in that transition, we're like, cool, when this is done, we're going to start again and, and have Ninja Tracks version two. And we brought in another partner of ours. So there's three of us. And then um, we're like, let's get a, a, go find a place that we could put the studio in. And we looked for ages and all we could find was one studio places. So everything is built around one studio, obviously, right? But we could, we could never decide if there was like a B studio that was kind of crappy. It was like, well, who's going to get that one? <laughs> so um, my partner, Casey, um, he had just moved. And like, you got an empty house. Like, it's like, let us rent it out as a company. And so we built the studio there. We totally gutted it. And we were able to do equal rooms like his and mine were identical so that's when i say we were sitting next to each other that's cool we were right on the other side of the the wall and we did it like floating everything and it was really done uh incredibly to you know meticulously well yeah, that custom furniture which i remember yeah. sure, um when my dad discovered youtube i think not long after that you know, he was like, man, have you heard of, have you heard of this guy? And he's got these custom amp racks and, you I know, my dad's amp rack, like, uh, he's, I guess you describe him as like an old school automath where he just figures out how to do anything he wants. And that was like, yeah, he, he was like seriously inspired by that. Oh, that's that cool. cool. Yeah. I think, um, uh, the, the guy that did the, built the desk for us, it, it was just sort of like this started as an art project sort of thing. And then he did all of uh, Hans Zimmer studios. All right. And then we kept seeing those in magazines and we were like, that's what I want. And we tracked him down. His name's Robert Bayer. And, but he's in Southern California. So if you're not there, you really, yeah, not going to ship a desk across the, the world. Oh, it only costs um, a couple thousand dollars. What's the, what's the deal? <laughs> Throw it on a ship. Yeah. It'll get yep. to you at some point. Um, so yeah, we, um, we, I worked there, loved, it was great. It was an amazing uh, studio and so nice to have the separate room where I had the uh, amp set up and I had space for infinite amps and all that kind of stuff. Um, but when COVID hit, um, like when I got it, I was like, well, I'm stuck at home for a, a month, but I have to work when I was, because I wasn't feeling bad for too long. It was like a week and then I was, but I was just stuck. Mm, yep. um, so I was working on a laptop and then, I'm like, I finished a bunch of music. Like, I'm doing fine on a laptop and headphones here and little, like, IK Multimedia speakers. Like, this is working. And then so I slowly started building my home rig um, because sometimes I just want to roll out of bed, grab a cup of coffee, and, like, tweak a mix or tweak a mix at 10 o'clock at night mm -hmm. and not have to do it during these hours where sometimes I'm tired, you know, and I just, mm -hmm. like, it's really unproductive to go like, well, it's nine to six and those are the times you got to work. And sometimes it's like, well, I work for one hour today, but I was here <laughs> for eight hours. So yep. that's, and then nothing gets done at home where my wife is like, are you ever going to move this one box from this here to there? You know, <laughs> just dumb things like that. That's my life at so, the moment, man. So I, f I feel you a hundred percent. So, you know, it got to the point where all of us were working from home so much. We're like, oh, well, we got this place that, we we're just not using enough to justify it. Yeah, it was, a, it was a tough decision, but what made it easier is before we made that decision, I had committed to making like this place, uh, which is just you know offside the living room here. It used to be the kids' playroom, and it was like neon green and Xboxes and beanbag chairs. But they got old enough to where they have computers in their room, and this was just a dead room. So um, this worked out, and I was doing really good work that I was really happy with here. And then um, the other thing, which is just, you know, studio nerdery, I was using the barefoot MM27 monitors yep. for ages. That's the big, they look like missile launchers. Um, that they're great. They're phenomenal. But 
when I switched over to the ATCs, and this was a journey. I've listened. I've heard had every monitor on the planet. I've gone through, spent so much money. I wish I could mm-hmm. redo that journey and just go straight to the ATCs. But I was just like, this is what I've been trying to hear my whole life. Like exactly it done. Uh, so this is. I used to have three monitors, and I jump back and forth. And now I'm like, oh, I just got the two monitors, and it's when I do it, it's exactly what I was hoping for. And then. Yeah, no, that's it. And so you put a video out about that, and then I needed to buy ATCs all of a sudden, which is quite—I I didn't because I can't afford them. But like, I was like, um, I, I we uh, spoke to James Lugo last week on the podcast, and um, mm-hmm. he's using because I have uh, Focal Twin Six BEs. Um, mm-hmm. I think he's got the Adam was the A seventy sevens. But I was mm-hmm. just sort of saying to him, like, I love these speakers for uh, mixing on in general. Like we're just generally mixing on them and working on them, but I don't really like the way guitars sound on them for some reason. Uh, they, they're a little bit like a little too harsh or something. They're not that pleasant. Whereas I was using Adam A7s for a long time before that and really liked guitars on those. And um, I said, you put your video out. I was like, maybe this is my problem. Maybe I need to spend twelve to fifteen thousand dollars <laughs> Australian to buy some monitors, of something different, and try them out. I've, this, I, to my knowledge, there's not anyone that has them around, so it's just like we're very limited with what we have in the, um, you know, in the part of the country we are, unfortunately. So one day well, I'll go hear them. Uh, won't just splurge that much money on a whim, but uh, yeah, because I think you also compared to those the the bigger IK monitors as well. I, I watched that video. Mm-hmm. Um, which I thought yeah they... yeah I had those for a little bit they they let me borrow those because uh, they had just come out yeah and they were shockingly good especially for the money but also so are Adam A7s you know there's Focals there's Focals I like and dislike in the same way like it's like expensive guitars mm. like you could get a custom shop Strat or a very expensive PRS that someone's gonna say like finally I it's I'm home yeah and then someone else <clears throat> will be like I didn't yeah. bond with it. I yeah. had a Callings electric that oh, right. was I lusted over for two years, and I finally sold enough stuff, and I got it. And I was like, "Oh, yeah, it's fine." Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, it's. But someone else, the guy, I take I had taken it to someone to um, just get a setup, and he was like, "Are you crazy? This is the best guitar I've ever heard. It's like <laughs> resonant and you, it perfectly balanced." So I'm like, "I just don't get it." Yeah. Like, so you um on that on that note of guitars, um one of my uh, students who I was talking for a long time, who's based in the states, they recently got a Shabbat, um, oh, yeah. and were just blown away with. And I'm pretty sure it's because they saw one of your videos. So what's oh, good. what are what are like the workhorses and the uh, do you just play everything and use it, or do you have like the stuff that you know works and then the stuff you play for fun? Um yeah, I I've streamlined down everything partly when we were moving the studio because i just there was not enough space and then partly there was just a time when i was like there's too much stuff like i had too many rack preamps that <laughs> were sitting in the corner too many effects and i still there's just too many things that i you can't use <coughs> them you know and there's i wanted to focus on making music and not just plugging into a piece of gear so i'm trying to find that gear music balance still um but on guitars i find it pretty easy to do that um so i have let's see i'm gonna take out my headphones i I hope this doesn't ruin everything oh hang on yeah okay oh the mic's back Uh, we can still hear you it's it's totally fine okay i didn't know if there'd be an echo or something i'm gonna grab guitars and i'll just bring them over so um i have it i have like five of them five other guitars that are upstairs in, in like storage. Um, it's shameful really to say like, Oh, I have, I have a Friedman, the blue Friedman telly that I I've used on a bunch of videos yep. um, that Grover Jackson made. It says Michael Nielsen on it. And that's they have awesome. a video of Grover like tweaking it and stuff. So like that oh, to man. me is like, that's a special guitar and it, I love the neck on it, but it's a little soft in in the mid range it's almost like a semi hollow body oh, okay so it's it's cool and it sounds great but i just don't it's not the sound i go for most of the time so uh but i for a long time that was what i would just play around 
the the house because it was also really kind of loud and I didn't need to plug in. Yep. Um, and then I ha- I've gone through a bunch of Friedman's, but th- this. Oh, um, I love that one. This that is just awesome. an amazing specimen. Um, and I just have these purple stickers I put on. Oh, okay. Oh, right, right, right. At some point in the videos, it's just as a black nothing, just to add some definition, you know? Yep. Um, and then I did, this is like a tribute to the ESP guitars. Oh, yeah. Like the Queensryche would have a block. In the yes, 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 yes. Um, in fact, the dots are stickers too, because oh. the normal ones are just a thin circle. Right. And um, if the light hits it wrong, it just disappears. And like, right, ah, right. It's gone. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I cheat with that. So hey, just on. just a quick question on that, like, because yeah. I've never played the Freeman guitars. How does that compare to like a, I mean, like a Charvel or something like that in terms of the neck profile? Is it thicker, thinner? Um, like what's um or a no, sur- the, like the a neck sur- profile? That they're um they're fatter. Okay. More slightly akin to. Old Charvels, according to Dave. Okay. I picked up a Charvel at one point. Um, oh no, it was uh, Jakey Lee's white Charvel. Right, was hanging on Dave's wall when they were working on the Jakey Lee amp. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, "Can I touch this?" He's like, "Yeah, do whatever you want." So I was like, "Oh my gosh, this neck feels really familiar." And he goes, "Yeah, it's the classic old Charvel neck." Right. Um, and so th- there's a similarity there to the the Friedman. Uh, next but it's definitely not like a ibanez um yeah yeah the wizard rg neck at all yeah because i'm much pl- much more of a c-shape round and what's nice is i was just telling someone this the other day there's like lacquer mm-hmm. like a, a prs comes and you go like yep that's glossy and lacquery yep. and then like a, a tyler feels like it doesn't have any on the back of it and then oh, there's yeah, it's really bare feeling. Um, so much so that sometimes you're like, does this feel expensive or does it feel cheap? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure. Yep. Um, but there's varying degrees in, in high-end guitars of how lacquery or how much I guess they take off at the end of the day. Yeah, right. Um, and I think maybe Friedman has the best balance of taking off. Right. It just feels great. Um, but I've never had a... like. My PRS has felt sticky sometimes, but I've never had that issue with like Les Paul, even though it's just as like lacquery. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is this is th- th- probably the guitar I associate you the most with. This particular Les Paul, um, it always just sounds great. It does. I started feeling like it was cheating after a while, and I'm like, I can't demo something with this because it. I don't know if <laughs> it's too good. Yeah, and I put Lawler Imperials in here, and it really does sound great in every style. It's it's really it could be a little too uh, maybe bottom heavy sometimes, but I mean it's it's always has cut and it sounds awesome. But what is it again? What's yeah. um, what year? What sort of is it? Uh, it's an R eight. Oh, an R eight. Okay. Uh, and I I don't remember what year it was. I've had it a long time, like 15 years or more. Uh, it, this is most of my favorite guitars were this same story. I went into the store at the time, what well, was Guitar Center, the high end room, mm-hmm. and they had just gotten in three of these, maybe four. Oh, right. And I played them all and I kept going back until it was like, no, it's this one. This is yep. 100% the one. Same with my Telly, which is out in the other room. I have a blonde Telly, which there was three of those, and that was clearly the best one. That's the story of my telly as well, actually. I think I went to five or six guitar shops to find my telly, and then, yep, yep. that was the one. So, uh, right, okay, and, and here one. we go. Yep. This yeah, is... so this was my first Shabbat. Man, that neck is just from it's a different insane. realm. I, it's nuts, right? Look at that. Whoa. That is crazy. I'm going to put it in, up to the camera now. Yeah. The, really yeah. bonkers. Um, I also put stickers here because with the, <laughs> the flame, there was uh, no yeah, seeing yeah. any of this. And I was uh, doing a charity show for my kid's school, and I kicked off one of the songs, a half step off, because <laughs> with the way the light hit, I lost the dot. And it was like, oh, that's bad. <laughs> Let me yep. quickly, 
I got to make changes here. Uh, but yeah, this is really lovely. Uh, it was the first strat that I was like, okay, I get it. This mm -hmm. is like, I know Leon, you have your strat. That's yes. like that. That sounds like you bond with that strat, but like, I couldn't just pick up any old strat. Like, I'm like, okay, it's fine. It's a strat, but this one I could hang with on yeah. like everything. What are the um, specs on it? Just in terms of, you know, for, for pure nerddom, because anytime you play it, it's always like, oh, it, it's like, it's the single coil equivalent of your Les Paul to me. It's like, yep, yeah, that's, that's got it, whatever it is. Yeah, well, part of it is the Shabbat thing. There's something about the way they put the guitars together. Like Tom Anderson's have a thing. Sirs have a thing. PRS have a thing. And they, it's strangely consistent to brand, even though like, it's just a lot. So much of guitar is just like, I don't know why it sounds that way. <laughs> <clears throat> you, you know, like I'm sure they, they, you know, the tone wood thing and all this, like, who knows, maybe it's just how they put it together at the factory. I don't know, but the Shabbat stuff, um, it's built in a small, really small place. And his, they remind me of like a Martin dreadnought. Like, okay. Or like a D28, uh, when you just go bling, mm -hmm. and all of his guitars were like that. So I had just taken guitars over there to get them fixed because um, I met Avi Shabbat when he built the first run of Friedman guitars. Oh, okay. I see. I have, I have a red uh, P90, dual P90 guitar that he built. So I was taking it over them there for him to take a look at. And I played a Strat on the wall that he had made like this is incredible and then i played there was one other i'm like this is equally incredible so that was a the sign of like oh you're doing you know what you're doing yep even if he doesn't know what he's doing it's accidentally doing it great <laughs> um, and i just got this this was um i had custom Ooh. this was my like oh dude wow this yeah. is me um and i'd been a telly guy and a les paul you know like a single cut person for so long and then I just made this transition to strats between the Freedmen and that Shabbat. But I really wanted to get back to the tally shape and have one that could do everything. Um, so I got the, the D tuna going. Yep. Is that a because down I only Floyd as well? No, it goes up and down. It goes up as well, right. Yeah. So it's, it's got that coil taps. Um, the, sorry, the, that Shabbat, the strat, has Lawler special pickups. Mm -hmm. the, what they're called, Lawler Specials. Um, I don't think there's anything uh, super unusual about anything else on that. It's just really nicely made. Um, this is, these pickups are wound by um, Phil McKnight. All right. Uh, really? From the Know Your Gear podcast. So he has a pickup company called Blackstock. And um, I was, like I love, I did a huge pickup shootout and they really stood out to me as like, these are cool. In some ways they were like the Bill Lawrence pickups that uh, oh, yeah. Nuno and Dimebag Don, use. Yeah. They had like a high fineness to that, like a flat clarity. Or I, sh I shouldn't say flat, like an open clarity mm -hmm. to them. But then they also had a, this kind of DiMarzio thing to them that okay. was like fun to play and nice, easy to play, and not scratchy and um, juice, juicy. I don't know. That makes no the, sense. The but Tyler. Oh, oh. The, the correct finish on it as well. Yeah. Burning water. <laughs> wow. Unreal. So this is actually, well, obviously, clearly burning water inspired, and I've always loved the burning water. I'm a huge Michael Landau fan, and I was just going to get a burning water, but some of them looked amazing and some of them didn't look amazing. So I was working with Rich Rankin who runs Tyler over there. And I was just trying to narrow down, like, how do, how do I tell you like what I think is amazing? And is it recreatable? Because it's just drips, you know, dripping down the, the guitar. So I pulled all these pictures and he goes, well, we don't actually make that. I, I did some Photoshop color changing. So we ended up doing, this is essentially the psychedelic vomit, which is the <laughs> Mike Landau signature. But instead of the purple, we made the purple black. Okay, so right, this is, right. He goes, oh, cool. We'll call it ninja vomit for your ninja oh, track. Oh, that's cool. 
So I got a custom uh, named uh, finish. But when it's it's uh, burning water, <laughs> it's pretty much. So it's pretty and funny is- with the arm contour. And you mentioned the Lawrence stuff earlier. Um, when I was 16 or 17 and like when I really got into guitar, uh, you know, my dad plays and had built guitars and had a bunch of parts lying around. So I kind of, um, and I remember at the time my parents, they got this like metallic paint that was metallic gray so they could paint all the door jams in the house. And there was like enough left to paint a guitar. So I like had this old body and then I saw like the Tyler soul thing with the forearm thing. And I was like, Oh, awesome. I'll just sand off that thing. And then I saw the photos of the old Steve I green meanie where he'd like cut in an extra, um, you know, like basically taken a traditional strat, uh, lower cutaway and just sanded it down to the pit guard, um, mm-hmm. which is, you know, very proto gem on it. So I also did that and I had Lawrence's in it as well for the Nuno thing. So it's kind of like, it was like my version of all my favorite super strats. And then I pulled it apart for whatever reason. I was going to put it back together and the parts got stolen. Oh. Like what? Like, yeah, it's like my my dad had this awesome Les Paul. Oh, it was called that, Limited yeah. Colors, and it was like a mocha color. It was like a gold top, but with like a m- coffee top on it. Oh. They took that, and then they took yeah, they took this neck, and they took this like body with nothing in it. Um, so yeah, I always it's a drag. I, I always feel like one day I'm just going to recreate, and it was like I did a crap job of all of it. <laughs> You know, and the action was way too high and the truss rod, I'd sh- I tried to adjust the truss rod, you know, myself and like shorn off the bolt. So it was one of those things where it was like, it was barely playable, but I still get a little bit nostalgic for it. It's like, oh man. And so seeing that kind of triggers that. Um, What do you have for electronics in it as well? Um, Well, I was shocked at how they actually do this. They actually finish the whole guitar and then they just cut with a star and go oh wow really really. yeah so if they mess up the whole thing is toast i was just blown away by that so i actually have this piece they gave me the the rest of it i have (laughs) really that's cool um yeah so this is essentially i tried to recreate the dan huff signature model and uh michael landau signature model and kind of put them together so it's got the the duncan hot stacks which um Dan Huff has in his guitar, which is, he has a different covering on them, but it's the same um, pickup, really. And then this is, it's called the Super, which is essentially like their take on the JB. Doesn't sound exactly like a JB, but um, also Dan Huff, um, is that what he had, had in his? I think he had a JB. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's basically Dan Huff pickups and electronics, with the Michael Landau finish. And then each of these switches do um, splitting or parallel, which is a new thing. I didn't really know that okay. you could make humbuckers parallel. And That's it's so awesome. Cause I like not my old, split. Yeah. My old light light guitar, I had a series parallel switch for the bridge. <laughs> so you could get kind of like telly ish. Uh, and it's I, great. Remember, I remember wiring that and it like, it was one of the first things I ever wired and I still suck at wiring guitars, but it's a really cool, like, alternate voice. Uh, to me, it, it sounds like if your standard bridge humbucker is your, like, your Eddie or your kind of Nuno, you know, thing, then the parallel thing is Paul Gilbert, like that quacky ADA you uh, yeah. had with Mr. Big. Yeah, with a really clear top. Yeah, yeah. All that. I, I agree. Um, it's a cool it, – it's really nice to be able to have that on each of the settings. And then this button – Let's see. Can you see this button? Anyway, oh, yeah. this button activates the the ah, yeah, well, preamp, yeah. nice, which right. is almost always at its <clears throat> lowest setting. Um, the dem it's it's a Demeter <clears throat> preamp that James Tyler shifted the frequency. So the frequency is basically like a low boost, and it quickly oh, overwhelms right. everything. Yeah, right. Um, it's not really a nice thing when you go any more than fifteen percent up. It just so much bass on it (laughs) this button oh this button's awesome this will activate the bridge and the neck at the same time and then you could still switch your uh i see and then so if you have some weird crazy concoction so i could put it on a middle pickup and push the button in 
now have all three pickups going <laughs> and you could adjust this business. And then if you want to go quickly to your back to just a bridge humbucker, right. this will jump back to that. So it's almost it's like, a roadmap. Yeah, yeah. That, a roadmap's a good way to say it. Um, I was it, I think like the guitar Brian May built with his dad, like you could turn each pickup on and off and change the phase and yep. you know, that's how he it's got actually, different sounds. It's a really great sound. Like um I'm blanking on what his name is. Amazing studio session player from the eighties. Um, that was huge with Michael Jackson and Madonna, like monster hits. Uh, a lot of the like skanky parts. Yeah. Oh, I, I was that. just watching he, uh, um, Paul Jackson Jr. Is that his no, name? No, it, it wasn't. Right. I mean, he is, he would fit that classification. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't him. Uh, this guy has passed away. He passed away, I think like five years ago or something around there. Um, but he used a guitar that Jim Tyler had rewired. And so all these famous parts um, were three pickups. Oh, wow. Uh, on at the same time. But it sounds great. It's it's like everything you like about the out of phase, but without being so scooped wow. out. Yep. That's amazing. So, that I mean, have you found it interesting how, I guess, yeah, you were like sort of the first person doing the 80s rack videos you know have you found it interesting how like acceptable say using chorus or having a floyd rose because you would have remembered like the early 2000s when i started playing i'd go on like to a you know a news agent and look at a guitar magazine and it'd be like someone playing a seven string saying like i don't even know what an a chord is and also fuck shred um mm -hmm. You know, that was just the attitude. It was like cool to sort of know nothing. And th it was like, it was pretty toxic when you look at it. It's like, why would you want to be good at guitar when you should just not give a shit? Um, and, you know, it was, yeah, it was just the cool thing was to bag out 80s guitars. And, and now like everything is acceptable, which I think is, which is nice because as you said earlier, like the Top Gun thing, it's, it's awesome. You know, and now it's like you see people unironically having, you know, like guys who are like serious touring pros, like, you know, they have like neon green guitars with Floyd Roses and, you know. Yeah, John Mayer is out with a, like a pink Charvel. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we can't do it anymore. Playing blues bloody. songs. Did you anticipate that when you started doing those videos for yourself that like it would actually be a thing, A, people want to listen to and B, it would kind of become cool again? No, not at all. Um, had I known that, I would have bought a lot more stuff at the really cheap prices. Yeah, I would have just bought everything at 150 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I did. I was able to, to benefit from some of that, some of the early stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's impossible to just dabble in it now because even at ADA MP1 is like to get one that works and is clean is 800 bucks. I mean, it's ridiculous. Like, that's why you got to have four in a rack like that. Um, oh yes it's actually technically not true there's i have two mp1s an mp2 and an mp1 classic and there's another mp1 a friend of mine uh, lent me that's in another rack so well that's I'm that's really how we that. became friends you know you kind of asked when we before we started recording like yeah, how legit. we knew each other uh my i was putting up demos on myspace that i was making with my like little boss hard disk recorder and uh i got i got this message from this guy troy he's like hey you like paul gilbert and racer x and i also have an ada mp1 so want to come and jam <laughs> Yeah. And it was, I was like, no way, this guy is not for real. Like, no one else would have an ADA MP1. And yet, sure enough, it was sort of like, how amazing is this that, you know, you can do this? And yeah, now I kind of, like, I feel bad for people who, you know, maybe had the rig back in the day and, you know, life happened and now they have some time to play guitar again. They're like, oh, maybe I'll just go and buy one of those weird old, things with the stupid push buttons 800 bucks why would i want to do that yeah and some of the stuff i mean the price i, I can't even tell people to go spend like i saw bogner fish preamp on sale on sale uh for <laughs> sale uh for like five thousand dollars so, like it's yeah. at the end of the day it's a preamp you know and yep. like an ada one ada mp1 is like for a thousand I mean, bucks you guys both did this <laughs> yeah it's we, your we fault. Are, like <laughs> on the <laughs> internet there's <laughs> like nobody that's put done out way more videos than i did he's yeah. probably more <laughs> at, at fault 
<laughs> yeah, Here fuck I, you, Leon. Thanks very much I for am, ruining it for everybody. I am the problem. Uh, there was a, there was definitely a. I think when I was just going mental with the rack ear and I had a friend who was just like sending me stuff, you know, um, it was like the arms race, like, you know, uh, shout out to Michael Torin as well, because yeah, right. well, I remember, I remember you would mention like, Oh, thanks to Michael Torin. I was like, who was this Michael Torin guy? And then, you know, I saw his collection of stuff and, you know, we messaged one another. We'll definitely have to get him on, but I was messaging uh, yeah. him the other night on Instagram. Actually, we were having a chat. It's, so, yeah. it's just, and he's like, you know, to me, he's also the nicest man. Like, he sends me cookies for Christmas. Um, like, you don't have to do this, Mike, but you do. So, <laughs> but the, um, yeah, you know, every week I'd like have some new, you know, here's some Sony effects process that everybody forgot about and be like, thanks, Leon. Now this is going to become unaffordable. Uh, <laughs> not, not quite as bad as what you get with like, uh, yeah, the, you know, the JHS effect, but definitely yeah. there. Yeah, I uh, I was at Mike's house uh, last weekend, um, and it, we, we were joking because, I mean, his racks uh, it's he literally has almost everything that you could possibly. <laughs> well, that's what, that's what I was like. What don't you have? And it was like three or four of the most like obscure. You know, six of these were made, and three of these were made. But I'll find him. But yeah, he, in I'm all sure seriousness, he will. He has he has ways. In the world, is there anyone that actually has a better, more comprehensive collection than him? Like in all seriousness, no, I don't think so. I, I think he has the premier collection. There's a couple guys that I've seen pictures that are amazing, also. But like, it'll lean really heavy on Digitac stuff, right? Or yeah. it'll lean heavy on. There's someone I in my know. Discord server who I'm pretty sure owns everything art ever made um right. so oh yes always, i think i know who you're talking about yeah yeah. so that's often and you know they like um and it's funny because all the stuff that i've tried where i'm like oh this is this is the stuff that gives this gear a bad reputation they're like no i've got one i love the way it sounds and it's like that's kind of cool that someone actually genuinely has it and appreciates it and you know their rack of art stuff and they have like three of the x15 controllers which are really good midi controllers um and I actually, they sold me their ADA pitch track, which I just always wanted one. And it's like the worst pitch shifter ever. Oh. So, um, you know, and <laughs> I it's saw mono. that video. It's mono. I'm so bummed. <laughs> you know, so it's sort of like, oh, cool. I'll maybe be able to do like an even tight style detune with this. It's mono, but, um, you know, it's oh. there. It looks cool. So, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's the Torin collection is like, it is. He needs to do a book, and I've actually emailed him about this and said, just do a coffee table book and have a photo yeah. of every piece of gear you have, and you know, totally. I'm sure you'll sell at least three copies. Oh yeah, like so, yeah. You know what's even more amazing about his collection, which I, I can't say at my height, I would go like, check out this amazing rack, and they'd be like, cool, can we hear it? Not at all, because none of it's plugged in. Yep. None like, of it works. It's racked. Yep, but. If you want to hear something, I have to take it out of the rack and we'll plug it in individually and stuff. That's all like stuff. all my stuff over here is just, you know, it's cool, but it's not wired in. I actually have integrated my favorite pieces into a working rack, but like all of that stuff is, yeah, it's a bit of a pain to hear it. Totally. Everything Mike has is accessible. Like, oh, you want to hear this? Would you like to A, B, this and this? Would you like to switch cabs? Yep. It's, it's incredible. I've actually learned a lot from just being able to A, B. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it's really hard to to identify what's great about a piece. Yeah, then you're really back on the Harmony song. Central, you know, just it's someone's opinion on the internet versus somebody else's opinion about what does and doesn't sound good. I used to print out those reviews. I'd print out 20 pages of reviews if I was going to go on a, a flight and just be like, yeah, right. let's read what this idiot thinks about uh, the Segnator preamp. And it's always the same. It's like oh, it's man. fat, warm, and bright. And um, Yeah, there's only punchy. so many descriptors people know. But no, I think man, that's like it totally destroys this. That thing's weak source, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah, uh, is it? Yeah, I don't, not to pump you both up, but like that's what I really appreciate about both your channels because like it, this stuff needs to be um, documented somehow because um, it just it didn't exist, you know. Like Leon, yep. you know, when we met many years ago and talking about ADAs and stuff, it's just here's ADA Depot, and there's a couple of guys on there that will post clips up with their like proto camera phones or whatever it was like awful guitar sounds and it's like it's just nothing else nothing else out there so yeah it's it's like important like it's you're not doctors 
but for the, <laughs> for the guitar player community, it's 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 doing an important service. So I uh, it was thank the, you everybody. <laughs> well, thank thank you and thank you, Leon. <laughs> I, it's funny because the show we played over in, oh, it's, I'm sure it wasn't funny for whatever was happening, but we played over East a couple of weeks ago and on the flight back, there, we got the like, is there a medical professional on the plane kind of thing? There was some non-life-threatening but very urgent issue with somebody on the plane, which I'd never had before. Um, mm. And <laughs> it was sort of like, you know, with you, you've had that like, once once 24 hours has expired in a band and you've been traveling the the schoolboy mentality is just it's on 11 you know so we were all kind of sitting there and you know we would <laughs> i just kind of I'm leaned over to Brian and i was like um this guy can sing and play bass at the same time should he have a look <laughs> <laughs> do you know how exceptional that is um so yeah that kind of thing you know it's like oh, i've got uh i've got a uh, three ada mp1s uh one stop one modded like can i help <laughs> oh it's brilliant i love that <laughs> oh man well so, not to hawk my own my own crap but like like what you're saying especially now it's like i started doing the Kemper profiles of the rack stuff and the, um, the IK tone X of that, because it was one for me, it was a pain in the butt to put together of like to drag out the 2150 power amp, which weighs every time mm -hmm. as a super, as a vacuum cleaner for a fan. And then like, it's, it's just a lot. Um, and then to be able to like, so you don't have to spend $3,000 to hear a Bogner fish in a 2150. Like yep. you can just plug into the over loud, THU or something. All like right. That. All right. Question. Yeah. Why can't I like use the <clears throat> THU to profile my own amps? Like, why will they not let me do that? Um, is this I can't a, tell you. Yeah. I, I knew that was good. I knew yeah. that was going to probably be the answer. I can tell you when we, hang, when we stop okay. the, um, so that, that's, that's a, you know, it, it was, one up to a trade secret. It was more of a rhetorical yeah. question because uh, I, I, I use that plugin a lot. That's my favorite um, digital amp. So, uh, like, I know. think it's really good sounding. Yeah, and um, underrated, very underrated. Um, I, I have it through the Slate subscription stuff, so that's kind of how I got ah. into it. But they also yeah. have your SPX ninety modeled in there. Am I right? Yes. That's so awesome. Yeah, the yes. that's a great the, public service that, right there. Is that's the gem yeah. plugin? Is that the is that the one? Or is that uh, yes? It, was, it started as part of Overloud T or THU, and then they exported it to part of the gem. Yeah, because I have that as well. I use that all the time. I can't believe how much you use that. Actually, it's um, it's good sounding. They, yeah, they did it, but it does a it. It's just a, I'm not like a chorusy type of a person most of the time. Mm -hmm. And then there's been some. I bought that plugin for a particular mix that I was doing, and I did the thing where I was like, you know what? I'm going to demo the plugin for whatever it was, 15 days, 30 days. And then um, by the time I finish the mix and it gets signed off, I'll be done. And then I didn't finish the mix till like two days after. So I had to <laughs> fucking, and it wasn't on sale. It was on sale like three or four weeks before that for half price. And I got stuck with the full bill for, I was like, God ah, damn it. But it was worth oh, it. Oh, isn't that the worst? Yeah. But um, yeah, they, in terms of the amps though, they sound so good. I was, um, again, this is just, I, I apologize. I meant to say that in a more of a rhetorical sort of way, because I remember uh, when that plugin came out and talking to Leon and saying, man, I can finally do like a Kemper style thing with software. I can't wait to do this. And I was like, oh, I can't do this. But, you know, it's- um, well, Have you tried the- And um, the neural amp modeler and- Now there's yeah. options, yeah. But that's, th I'm talking like five, whenever, five years ago. When yeah, yeah, out, yeah, yeah, exactly. Really different. Um, but yeah, it's, because um, the Tonex stuff's really cool. I've, I actually use that, um, I use that for a lot of tracking sessions for mm -hmm. uh, particularly want to do full uh, like live band tracking sessions i'll just throw that on a di for the guitar players and it's it's previously i was um and this is in a uh the studio below my studio where we are right now uh where i don't have all of my plugins and everything on it but i do have enough licenses to put my ik stuff on there so yeah it was either that or using sans amp or um uh, digi design 11 or avid 11 but right. which is still fine don't get me wrong but then you put the Tonex up and you throw a Marshall patch on and it's like, oh, this sounds great. This sounds not not just usable. Like this is pretty, could very easily just be the sound and then we just finish it up. I still like totally. recording amps, so I can't help myself. But yeah, but it's, you know, it's so easy. It's all so good now. That's the, it's not an unfortunate thing. It's a great thing. Um, but it's also like um, you did a Kemper pack. Wasn't there the, the like, it was a Friedman where it was a one-off or they were produced for a, 
very, very small amount of time? Yeah, my, the, um, my main BE100 that Dave made, um, I kept going back and forth. I'm like, I can't decide on a Dirty Shirley or a BE100. You, and he was like, well, I'll just I'll put it, build a custom one with the Dirty Shirley on one side and a BE100 on the other side. So that that's what that amp is. Wow. And it's amazing. And the Dirty Shirley side is crazy because normally it has a much softer, more vintage feel but when you put it into the be 100 power section it's just a hulk and it so it's really beefy uh but it goes from clean to massive uh that's probably what i my main someone asked me the other day like what do you play through and um that's probably the main thing that i i play through that or the the 20 watt little sister oh, which yeah. is the dirty shirley little sister which i love also because strangely, I don't really like loud noises. So like, I, I like it full, but like in studios, like I've been to studios where people are like volume and it's like bashing, like it hurts, physically hurts me and I can't hear it. So like, yeah, I'm a like bit I like that. Here kind of, that. Say again? Oh, I'm a bit like that as well, where, you know, you spend enough time in front of monitors with all that control that like a four by 12 can be a lot if you play it for more than five minutes or something. Yeah. Do you know, yes. I'm I'm going the other way. I'm sorry, everyone. I, I When I'm mixing, it's different. I mix really quietly. Um, but when I'm tracking guitars or actually doing any track, when I have other people around, it's loud. Um, I kind of can't help mm. myself. And also, like I've said this on, uh, on this a couple of times, but um, spending so much time over the last 15 years not playing through an actual amp, but just going either direct and using in-ears yep. or, or doing recording sessions where it has been really quiet, I sort of miss the feeling of like a four by 12 or a two by 12 or whatever, just like hitting. So I'm trying to spend more time and I was doing it uh, last week, just cranking up amps just to, to know what that sensation is like. Cause I'm trying to connect the dots of you know, like you do a session and I know what sounds good through studio monitors, but if a guitar player's coming in and they're expecting something different because they are used to playing in front of a real amp. Like, is there a connection there that I need to try and adjust what I'm hearing in the studio monitors to what they're feeling? I don't know if I'm explaining that very well, but like, yeah, I'm just trying to learn a bit more. I'm just trying to understand a bit more from different perspectives. And that's been one thing for me that's been uh, interesting this year, at least the last six months, probably. Mm. So anyway, that's it. Anyway, you were saying about the 412 you have in there. Oh, yeah. Like, um, I've gone th through the journey of like 112, 212, yep. two 112s. <laughs> And it's just, there's something about the sound of a 412 that that sounds like the guitar amp. So it doesn't even have to be super loud. Um, it can, you can get a good sound, it has to be decently loud, but not peel the paint kind of. Um, because one of my favorite videos that you did is just, <clears throat> it's like how to record a guitar amp. And it's, it's quite oh. short, but it's, it's one of those, to me, it's like one of those like public service utilities on there it's like you put a 57 here and you put a ribbon mic here and you do this with the channel strip and it sounds pretty good i'm sure you guys have gone through this too of like there's some days you say you feel like you're a genius and then the other days you feel like you're an idiot yep why would i think that i could tell anyone how to record an amp because all of my guitars sound terrible this week yeah you know it's like it just it's one of those those things you know it's cycles of like up and down. How do you find uh, the, like, to me, listening to the stuff you do on YouTube in the gear demo space, like, it's pretty clear you've, you know, I feel like people take YouTube way too seriously, one. And two, it's, like, pretty clear that you've done it for a living. Like, even your, the demo tracks that you do, and I'm sure you see it consistently where people are like, holy shit, man, like, that 90-second intro you did, is amazing like you should turn that into a song and then i'm sure they then dig around they're like oh you this is what you do professionally okay no like, one digs no one even yeah, reads no one digs because to me it's just like, thing. like of course this is great like do you know what he does you know like you do this for money um and especially in an it like i guess you could say where it all happens like you know you're in LA and like that's just what you know you need there's like a there's a bare minimum requirement I guess to be in the line of work that you're in you know where there's like 
it's a bit more like, I guess, being a pilot where, you know, anyone can drive a car, but like in order to drive a plane or fly a plane, you know, you got to like, you got to have the chops for it or something. So how do you find that? Because I know for me, it's just your ears, how hydrated you are, how much sleep you had. And you have like a thing come in where you're like, cool, I need to demo this. And you're just like, oh man, this all sounds bad. And then you put it out and people flip out, flip out over it. And other, th- and then the reverse where you're like, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. And people are like, eh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, uh, I, I will say though, there was a, a big learning curve to kind of learning this kind of guitar centric music that's instrumental. Like just everything was kind of different, especially since I was kind of coming from like, I had done guitar stuff and then there was about a decade where I was doing score stuff and a lot of synth stuff. And that was my world. I didn't play guitar at all. Barely. Uh, Like I I think there was a time where I had one guitar and like one amp and, that was it. Uh, and I rarely used it. Um, which is why I started the YouTube channel. Cause I was like, I remember really liking guitar. I should learn how to play again. And, and then I could buy some stuff. Um, but there was like, uh, like I, I told you guys before we started, like I listened to, to your stuff and I go, Oh, that's what awesome guitars sound like. And the mixes that Troy did is like, okay, this is how these pieces fit together. And like I, I'm always referencing and trying to, to learn that stuff and been just really lucky to um, to have people like Dave Friedman where I send him something. He's like, that doesn't sound right. Can you try this? And it's like, OK, that's I mean, a lot of my acapella guitar ear has been shaped with Dave, <laughs> which has been quite helpful. I mean, he's, you know, like to me, he's got one of the best guitar ears in the business. No, he's not like Dave Jordan or some record producer, but like he, he comes at it from the different angle. Like mm. he sat in the room with all of the best guitar players. And what does that sound like? And he, he has that internalized. So he just plugs in and goes, that's not right. There was a video that really like nailed that home for me. Um, I think it was at Henning's place. Because there was a like five or six amp designers, and they did a blind test. I remember Each that. Guy yeah, yeah. had to yeah, dial yeah. in the amp, mm-hmm. and uh, I think at the end. I'm sorry if I'm wrong, but I believe at the end, Dave, they had all picked the amp that Dave had dialed in as the best sounding one, <laughs> and also they picked Dave's amp as the best sounding one mm. afterwards. So it was like he just he just has it, like he really knows. So that's been super helpful, and I'm, I'm always trying to figure it out like i steal shit from uh pete thorne all the time like how do you make this work like sonically i mean like, the, oh, the very first demo good. video i ever did was for a friend who makes pedals and he, he was like can you do a video with this pete thorne style and i was like okay i think i know what you mean which is like write a piece of music that doesn't suck <clears> and <throat> then go through it because yeah i mean there's sort of like pete wrote the book on how to do it well there's like him there's uh like andy martin for which his Mm -hmm. great thing is arranging popular pieces of music for like solo electric guitar which is like he's almost like tommy emmanuel but on electric you know and it's like yeah you're gonna hear you're gonna hear like 12 songs from the 60s 70s 80s 90s all on guitar they're all gonna be really clever arrangements and it'll just work and it sort of also doesn't get in the way and then there's like Brett Kingman here in Australia, who he's just another guy who just sort of like, he dials it and you're like, that sounds really, really good. And he's been doing it since, you know, year zero on the internet. So yeah, yeah I always kind of think those three guys are like, if you, if you don't know, if you get a piece of gear and you don't know how to demo it, just like think, what would they do? Um, and I guess now you have like Ola England as well. He did the whole, like this amp metal. You know, yeah. like it was, <laughs> it was like the first, but I mean, it was strange because it was like the first guy doing demos of these really high gain amps where it actually sounded good. It wasn't like a phone camera in a room at a rehearsal studio. It was like, oh, yeah. you mic the amp properly and you can play and you've got the, like, you've got the, 
playing ability as well you know you like you know how to get the sound where it's like it's authentic to the yeah. genre too like, yeah you can go on like so well watch like a 12 year old video of him playing like a booster dual rectifier or an angle or something you're like oh that's what that sounds like cool now i've got that like reference point in my head so but yeah i think still pete is the best um where it's like every video has an original piece of music with all the different parts suit the sounds and you know he's laid back enough where you're like, oh, this kind of feels like hanging out with a buddy, but then he's really knowledgeable and he doesn't have a big ego, but he's done the big gigs. It's just like, yeah, you, he's, he's, to me, he's like the, he's got the perfect balance in there. I agree. And what's crazy is how many songs he's done. Mm. And because I look through and I, I go, okay, I maybe have done 40 or something like that. Uh, since the beginning and you know some are shorter than others and that but like i gotta do another one i have to do another one this week i'm like oh i don't even I have no idea what to do no idea and he cranks out like two a week sometimes yeah. and they're complex and musical and just the thing and good. i think that's the thing i really enjoy about uh and i, I did a, an interview with a buddy of mine years ago like pre-pandemic who's a bass player for a metal band over east here and he was talking about how like for him podcasting is you get to you get to be like a little bit creative a small amount very often rather than you know releasing doing an album is like there's a lot of creativity in it but it takes a long time or releasing a single or something like that so um i know personally for me it's like you do a video on an even tide or something like cool this is an excuse to get like the strat out with the landau sounds and try to like write a little piece of music or like learn a piece of music that you've never sat down like it's it it's it's creative in a different way that i think like the full-on like no i'm an artist and i need to like release my masterpieces it's just like you can just kind of play guitar and have fun and also try to get better at doing these things which which i like and yeah. you know um yeah even even because i remember watching your like zach wild video which is still one of the best like recreations of that sound Thanks. and like going through the the rack and i think that's probably the video I was like oh i want to get an spx 90 and i want to like get a dep5 and these things just because i didn't know like that's part of the fairy dust on there and now i listen to no more tears and i'm like yeah that is what that symphonic chorus sounds like it's literally just a preset but you know had to be right place right time right kind of context and things like that so um i like when people will put in a comment i, I it shows up like once a month someone with such conviction writes in the comments uh like uh zach wild used dual rectifiers and <laughs> You know, whatever, a boss DS1, whatever it is, you know, or like uh, the Nuno stuff. Like, I'll be talking about the ADA, ADA MP1, and they'll be like, uh, Nuno uses Marshall uh, D, whatever they are, 2000s, whatever. You're like, dude, I've been obsessed about this stuff for 30 years. Like, yeah. That's yesterday he was using this amp. Like, we're talking about this specific slice. And we were uh, talking a few months ago about the um, the Randall signature amp of his because mm. it was, like, I mean, yeah, designed, co-designed by a uh, guy here in Perth, um, oh. which is a whole story in and of itself. But, um, yeah, it's because they're basically – do you guys have Ashton, the brand Ashton, over in the States? No. I think they were in like an, Austra they're yeah. like an Australian – They're like I a sheep – like you know student ha level sort of brand. You know Harley Benton in Europe? Yeah. yeah, it was like that, but 20 years ago in Australia. So yeah. it was just, they were affordable student instruments. Yeah, but they basically okay. made, they made these like uh, 100 watt valve amps. And um, I think a little bit of extra goss I got after this was it's, it's the same factory that made Randall, I think, wherever that came from. But uh, um, yeah, effectively, it was like a modded Ashton amp um, that became the Nuno signature amp because, yeah, the guy that designed it, um, owned a music shop here in um, in Perth, and yeah, it's Nuno's bro ex brother in law. So it's a lot of little little oh. things happening here. So wow. yeah, anyway, that was um, that became the um, the the Randall Nuno amp. But then um, 
I think he stopped using it because it was a little bit unreliable because, yeah, from what I understand, because a guy that uh, worked at the same music shop as this was all happening, he used to um, use them and gig them. And he said, man, I just, I had to stop because they just kept blowing up. Like they weren't made to take the punishment of lots and lots of gigs and touring and stuff. And um, yeah, they were like basically pushed to the limit of what the, they could handle. Um, and uh, yeah. I've never had like played through one of those, been in the room with one of those. Me neither. Never seen one in person. So there you go. You can go on eBay and look up an Ashton Viper. Yep. And and uh, <laughs> a tip there. And then there's probably some some basic mods you can do to it. Um, this is. I feel like this is creating some gear chaos, and I love it. I love yeah. the thought. Let's of jack the price up. Looking, I love the thought of Dave Friedman looking at one of these amps as well eventually, and like just you know what what could happen. Um, the there was another thing I was going to say with that uh, while I'm over here fanboying. Uh, the the Zach video was great. There was the uh, also massive kudos for the uh, vintage guitar magazine thing because oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I like you know my dad has like every issue of guitar player guitar for the practicing musician like in mint condition. And when I started playing, I used to read all of them. Um, and I remember like you know like being oh it'd be cool if these were all online or someone doing. Them. And then when you started doing them, I was like oh finally someone's done it and it happens to be someone i really like as well where you just sort of like look at this see it's like skid row and look they're in this ad with adas or you know all the forgotten brands um yeah i it's i think that's a throwback. cool thing they they actually take a ton of time to do because you're reading in real time so i ended up having like an hour and a half hard. that i have to edit down and then once i've read it i'm like i don't really want to go through it again and edit it down <laughs> It's no fun the second time. Yeah. Because I think I'm... I, of, sorry, you get it, right. No, I, I, I just had some old gear catalogs <laughs> like that. <laughs> the internet strikes again. But yeah, I, I tried to do one with like an old 1992 gear catalog, like, you know, critiquing Ooh. the prices and trying to figure out what they are in relative terms. And like, basically, gear is way more affordable now. But that video was a nightmare to edit because there's so many... Um, hmm. <laughs> Just yeah. dead space. Yeah. Electronic. Oh, wait, that's TC Electronic. Yeah. Oh, here's a really bad joke. So, anyway, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I appreciate what goes on behind the scenes with those. And you were going to say. I was going to say, speaking of the magazines, like that's how I started playing, which is like you buy a magazine and there was tab and you learn the tab and I'd go to some place and this guy's like, oh, my God, you're a virtuoso. <laughs> Little does he know. I don't know what key I'm in or how to use this to a chord or anything like that, but I could do a, a you know, all fingers <laughs> yeah. thing like you this. Know, it's Jeff Watson. Yes, totally. Cause that was the, epi that was the magazine issue. Um, so like I had all these like fun tricks and stuff and then the nineties hit and it was like, well, I can't do any of this. And for a long time, like I would pick, if I was recording, I'd pick backwards oh, because okay. it sounded like I didn't know what I was doing because I had too much of that like yep. precision Paul Gilbert. I couldn't play like Paul Gilbert, but that thing that sounded too precise. So mm -hmm. I had to undo that. And it, to be honest, even it was, I would say in the last like year or so, I started hearing bands because my, my son who's 17 listens to a ton of Japanese like anime rock and stuff. Yeah. The J rock stuff's huge. Unreal guitar playing on that stuff like 190 bpm the piano player is playing ragtime the drummer is like <laughs> in quadruple time and then the guy's shredding on top of all this stuff and like it just struck me of like you know what these things that because of the 90s and early 2000s that i had this bias of like it's corny to to go blah, 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 blah. like so i just wouldn't do it i was like you know what F that. Like, I like that. And I'll listen to stuff with that. I'm just going to start, like, take the shackles off and do whatever I want to do and bring that stuff back that I loved. And it really just made guitar playing, like, more fun. Yeah. Like, because that's what I really love to do anyway. So it's I was like, gonna say, know, whatever. I like, recently, uh, there's been a lot of parts of your demo videos that you do where I'm like, Nielsen, what the fuck was that, bro? Like, you know, where it's <laughs> oh, just thank like... You. It's just like, oh, this guy has superpowers that is not always showing. You know, some of the like huff stuff, 
um, or even like the Zach Wilde pentatonic thing, which I've just never been able to do in my life. And then you'll just do it. And it's like, that sounds so good. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it definitely comes across that, you know, it, it's, it's kind of, I, I never know with YouTube as well, where, whether it's like, is this person practicing heaps and they're getting better or have they just always been able to do this and they've kind of like not wanted to show off? Cause it's such a weird medium, you know, where like, yeah, you demo an amp. So it's like, most people want to hear, if you play a Marshall, most people want to hear like an A, G and D and twist the knobs and you know, that's a demo of the amp. But then if the amp's good, you're going to have fun. So you're going to play like all the cool shit you know how to do. So, you know, and then people are like, well, it would have been cool if you didn't use so much distortion. It's like, no, no I was enjoying the amp. <laughs> I'm always jealous of your videos because they seem like, you know, you can't tell because it's YouTube, but you're so fluid. And I, it's funny because I think that's how you speak also. You don't say, um, uh, 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 uh. there'll be long gaps with no edits. Whereas I'm thinking like, he didn't make one grammatical error. This It's like so nice to listen to, but that's how you play also. It comes out as like, this is very organic and natural. And mine is like stutter chops. And like, I have to edit this. I'll start it four times. Like, nah, let's do this. So my videos are like, chop suey just to get the good parts in there but, but you know as long as you get the good stuff that's all that matters you know yeah at the um, end of the day just making it up off the top of my head it's just like yeah it's a, it for the record straight. that is pretty much how he plays like it's um it's a lot more in time than it used to be like when we first met <laughs> But it's, uh, yeah, that's just like Leon's pretty much had that ability since, like, I think you were 18 when we met. Yep. Yeah. So he's he's had most of that ability since at least that, um, yeah, at least then. And uh, yeah, just. I, I practiced really hard for about like 18 months when I was at high school. And then, you know, I, it's I'm sure you go through similar things where it's like, some days you feel like you're just playing like a dog. So you're like, right, I'm going to get the metronome out and just practice, actually practice guitar for 30 minutes. But yeah, I think, I think for me, it's like, you know, it's, um, I was watching a thing with, so you know who Marco Pierre White is like the chef. Um, mm -mm. he's, he's an English chef. He's probably best known because he was like the guy Gordon Ramsay studied under. Um, oh. and then, and apparently a, an absolute bastard, you know, like, like the the one guy who made Ramsey cry kind of thing. Wow. But um, I watched this sort of interview with him recently. He's like, yeah, you know, I had a Michelin restaurant. He's like, I'm retired. I'm just a home cook now. And this video is like, you know, old, but there's a series where he's, it's just a commercial for stock cubes, <laughs> right? So it's the, hey, Michael Nielsen, can you please demo our modified tube screamer? You know, like, well, we've got budget for it. Will you do it? Like, to me, it's always like, oh, another distortion pedal. Oh, there's budget? Cool. Yeah, sure, I'll do this. Um, <laughs> and he's like, he's simultaneously phoning it in so hard, but having the best time of his life where he's like, stock cube, you can get that, rub it on a steak. Do you like the way it tastes? Then that's good. Who cares? You know? <laughs> and he's just been like fucking around for like, like one of the most amazing influential chefs on the planet. He's literally spent the last two decades just fucking around having fun. <laughs> that's um, amazing. I gotta find this. It's just like, I remember watching this and just being like, this is actually just the energy I want to have in my life with guitar where it's like, it's, it started off fun, you know, where you're kind of interested in it. And then some, you know, somewhere along the line, someone told you you were good. Um, and you're like, oh, okay, now I have that to live up to. And then that can, that can kind of like poison the well sometimes, um, mm -hmm. you know, where you, you can lose track of what you're like. You're like, no, I have to play a certain way and I have to do a certain thing. So, yeah, sometimes, and <laughs> it's like, you know, no one's ever going to make millions of dollars like recording and releasing albums of rock music anymore. But that's kind of fun because then you don't have to, you can just you can just leave it all in in there. You're like, well, if you don't like it, go fuck yourself. You know, go go exactly. listen to something else. There's something else out there that you probably like. Um, you know, so yeah, having that, you know, whether it's authenticity or whether it's just like a stupid indulgent attitude, I never know. But um, yeah, it's I having having that kind of thing there where you're just like, yeah, cool. You know, if you need me to not do that, I can probably also do it and be a little bit more polite, but also who's watching this? You know, I don't know if you read like the analytics on your YouTube, but it's like 
mine's really improved from 100% male to like 99.3% male oh. audience. So, <laughs> you know, I feel like that's a great win. That's a big move, yeah. It's like, well, hey, this is a this is a step in the right direction. So, um, yeah. Yeah, mine yeah. are all, it, it's like 98% male, um, mid-40s. Yeah. And, you Which know, makes sense because, like, they were on Sunset Strip, like, watching bands. Yeah, but at the same uh, time, it's kind of easy to make fun of that and just be like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, dudes in their mid-40s. But it's like their, their experience is as valid as anybody else's. So, like, and they've had to live through, you know, the 90s of their experience just constantly being invalidated. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's more, more power to those dudes. You know, if they want to watch YouTube and, like, hear Van Halen riffs, that's kind of a nice way to spend your life. You could be doing a lot worse things. And, you know, if they want to like watch your channel or watch my channel or watch Pete or something. And also they, they kind of support this kind of like cottage industry of amp and pedal manufacturers as well, who are, you know, smart people and like decent people doing cool stuff. And it's like, you know, someone has to support that. If no one's buying the gear, there'll be no cool gear. So, yeah. you know, I, it's... And there's a like, lot of joy to be had by, strangely, plugging into one amp that goes... And another amp that goes... And another amp that goes... I don't know why. It just lights me up. It's wonderful. I'm it's just learning. With you. I just... I like learning, you know, trying yeah. different stuff. Why does this do that? Why does that do that? It's the... You know, I use it as an excuse of why. That's why I've uh, sorry. I use the excuse of having a recording studio and working with a bunch of bands. Like that's why I need to have so many amplifiers. It's like <laughs> yeah, I just, I literally could use a plug. I could use the same plugin for most things. I can use eleven and it's fine. But um, yeah, but you could also eat packet new like Migoreng and you know just kind of get by. Sometimes it's nice to you know yeah. have a nice have a nice steak or or some ribs that you cook for eight hours. Did you get to your other questions, by the way, Troy? Oh, yeah. I had one. Oh, one was about the THU thing. So I got that out of the way. Um, actually, interesting segue because just um, uh, I, I noticed you uh, – sorry, this, I'm stuttering off my words here. I'll start with the first part. You are wearing an unfair child shirt in a video that I saw the other day. So mm -hmm. are you – I can't remember. Have you got the GB tracker? I have the GB tracker, yeah. I, yeah. I wish I had the unfair child. I just can't. I have a, a rack in this uh, corner, mm -hmm. in the sort of closet. Ooh. It's covered right now. Oh, I, I, thought, I was waiting for the big reveal, but it was just a... Uh, oh, yeah, okay. I'm joking. Uh, okay. He's going for it. All right, here it comes. Okay, so there's the rack. Oh, right on. That's very cool. That has, um, like, the manly stuff and my Neve and... Yep. Um, all that kind of stuff. So I just don't turn it on all that often. Yep. To be honest, like I have a couple things I turn on, like uh, API compressor, SSL compressor, Allen Smart, mm -hmm. and the reverbs, and everything else. Like it's really specific. Like once a month, I'll turn on the Veramu yep. or something like that. So you got I just the twenty. Can't justify it. You got the twenty five hundred API. Is yes, that the one talk? Yeah. Love that. I've been using the plugin of that a bit recently. It, it, I, I've used it like on and off for years, but I feel like I just worked out how to get it to do the thing I want it to do. Um, as Are you a, using the UAD one? I'm using the Waves one, which- Oh, the Waves one. Okay. Yeah. I, I've had that for ages. The UA, I haven't tried the UAD one um, just because I, I feel like I can't justify buying another compressor at the moment. But um, it's just, uh, yeah, I've been using it. Uh, like on drums and stuff, like as a drum um, submix and also just on the whole mix bus. And yeah, I've been really liking it. I've also been well into um, Very Moo Land as well, just using the, uh, actually just using the Slate, um, whatever that one, like bus compressor, like Fairchildy style bus, bus compressor mm -hmm. has. Just because I've been using an SSL style thing for years and years. I'm just trying to try something different. Um, but that's, oh, sorry, coming back around. So the GB Tracker, um, I did watch your video. You did put a video out, and I'm pretty sure. But I'm trying to, yeah, yeah. And I used, it, that was life changing for me. Oh, don't say favorite. that. It's so great. Um, oh, damn it. Do you yeah. watch his channel? So they, Do you watch Eric Valentine's channel at all? All the time. Yeah, he's one of my favorites. Yeah, oh, he's, he's so brilliant. I, stuff ever. I think he's like the best at teaching. Oh, maybe not teaching audio, but like talking about 
ideas of how to mix and be creative in the studio. Um, there's a lot of like a lot of guys doing that, but it's like, it's the, I don't mean to pump you guys up again, but it's like when you see someone that is actually that good doing something like, you know, it, it's means something different than watching X, Y, Z. It's like, I do a YouTube channel, uh, to teach you how to like mix a song. It's like, it's going to be, there'll be information in it, but it's like coming from that guy, like he knows what's up and he's been down every conceivable rabbit hole to get to that conclusion. Like, that's what I want to, who I want to hear from. Um, yeah, it's like uh, watching a Tim Pierce video. You're like, well, yeah. I can stop uh, making yeah, videos exactly. now. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, but the GB tracker. So uh, when that was announced, I was like, man, I have to, I have to get this thing. And then it took a little longer for it to come out than I was expecting. And I've since got the little labs ready. Um, and that kind of does, I mean, it does a similar mm -hmm. sort of thing, but, um, but also yeah, you, great. Yeah. What is it about the GB tracker that you um, that you're liking, like still, I mean, it's been a little while now, so, uh, the, the it's super transparent mm -hmm. to go through it. Yeah. So I could record my DI and hit the amp and then it's super transparent. Um, and then the notched gain stages yep. really is great so that it's always the same coming in and out. It's like, you're going in this much, you're adding that and you're taking away that much and they just match up Yeah. rather than. I would always have problems matching my gain level. So was, I'd be like, all right, this is what I, it sounds like when I go into the amp, but when it goes through the computer and through the converters and back out in these gain stages, I'm trying to find that level and it's, I can never get it to match. It was always too much gain, too little gain. It was too squishy. It just never, never matched up. Yeah. I, I find this a uh, similar thing, like trying to reamp. Um, I was trying to work out, uh, this is probably a discussion for a different time, but what would be the most scientific way of trying to get the the level coming back in to the amp to be consistent? Um, because I, I can't quite work out, because obviously, you know, to go straight in through DR or, you know, straight to the front of the amp, like how to measure that level versus, you know, I, I just don't know what how to do it, you know, with metering or whatever, yeah. but it's, um, I mean, the solution is to get the GB tracker, but it's very, very expensive. So maybe one day I'll do that. In case anyone is interested in signal flow and what I was thinking about while I was at my son's um, uh, swimming lesson this morning, because I have a two notes torpedo reload. So this is really nerdy. And then we, yeah, it's, I'm really sorry, but I need to talk about this because I have to process it. I have a torpedo reload, right? So it's a load box, but it's got a reamper and a DI and stuff built into it. It's like a multi-tool sort of thing. Uh, but I use the, uh, the little labs for all my DI and reamp purposes. So, um, never occurred to me until like this morning, but you know, the, the, uh, ready has the, uh, what's it called? Ex expansion output. Hypothetically, I should be able to take the expansion output into the reamp input on the, the torpedo load box. Cause that has a reamp built into it. And then I can reamp out into a separate amp so I can do a full dual amp scenario situation, uh, for recording and tracking. I think it, you need to see this box. I think you'll understand what it is a little bit more. The the two notes reload what it um, what it is in terms of a device. But anyway, I was just uh, I was just thinking like, man, I, I want to do more dual amp stuff. I well, wanted to do that a little bit a uh, little while ago, just because why not? You know, why just record a directifier when you can also have that going through your Splawn Nitro at the same time? Just oh, and it sounds. It fills it out so nicely yeah you could reamp it and do it like that but i can do it in one hit and save my i can spend three hours trying to connect it up now to save <laughs> maybe three minutes when i do the the reamp track you know what i mean like it's just a real <laughs> useful time so i'll just leave that rambling ranting raving lunatic stuff for another time um but yes i have a question for you guys yeah that you're uniquely qualified to answer um Verly from Past Effects. Leon, you, you've shown yes. a lot of the past yeah. effects. Uh, so Verly asked if I knew what a Tim Tam is, which <laughs> I don't. Oh. And if I'm on a diet, she's not going to send me any, but is, is this something I want? It's yeah. definitely something that you want 100%. It's, um, Mate, so do you know what a Bicky is? A Mickey? A Bicky. Nope. Well, mate, you've got to learn what a Bicky is, and then you learn what a Chalky Bicky is, and then you learn what a Tim Tam is. <laughs> what a Tim Tam is, yeah. It's, um, so, you know, biscuits in America are those savory things you have, like biscuits and gravy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, biscuits over here are cookies. 
Um, oh, okay. So Tim Tam Tam is a chocolate cookie. It's like a chocolate wafer cookie. No, not wafer. That's... It's not wafer. There's wafer in there. No, 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 no. It's biscuit. It's biscuit with a bit of, uh, or cookie, sorry. It's cookie with a bit of no, like- No, no, no. I'm thinking of something else. I'm a moron. I actually need to renounce my citizenship. Mate, yes, go it is. buy a pack of Tim Tams. <laughs> Crikey. You have a cup of tea. You have a you have a Tim Tam. <clears> and because it's like a kind of rectangular prism, what you do is you bite each end off and then you kind of suck the tea or the coffee through the biscuit, saturating it and changing oh. the texture. So, yeah. It, it's funny, actually, because I saw you did the video with all the past effects stuff, um, which and like the, the Van Halen flanger thing was... Like I was when I saw you doing, it, I was like, I hope he has a hop for flanger, and I hope it's the first thing up. And it was like, <laughs> <laughs> there yeah, it is. That's so fun. Did you like the um electric mistress clone? Um, so that uh, a buddy of mine, Nick Wiswell, who I work with at Microsoft, um, he's a, he has this monster pedal board, and he was going on vacation. He, he goes, I'm going to send you all the past effects. Oh I wow, you'll like it. So uh, he sent me a box of all the stuff, and he had two of the electric elastic mattresses and so he let me have one of them but i haven't had a chance to really dig through it all i was able to go like this course oh cool this course this, oh cool yep. but no, the flanger was like instantly as soon as it went ur, 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 i was like <laughs> oh, all i want to do is spend an hour just going ur, 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 oh it's ur, ur, so ur. good and yeah there's a, like i think they call it like the waldo switch on there for the van halen thing it's it's like a level of detail. Billy's basically like the Dave Friedman of modulation pedals, like <laughs> knows more about this stuff and has more of this stuff. Um, they've sent me um, stuff to demo, but they'll be like, oh, I have a bunch of cool like vintage stuff. Like, do you want a 1975 small stone to do a video with? Or do you want like a Boss BF1? Or um, they had a like an original electric mistress, which was like just... You know, if you're like Alex Lifeson, you're like Andy Summers, it's like, it's the sound. Um, but yeah, the elastic mattress is, I didn't really think I liked flanges. And then I tried that and I was like, this is actually, this is the sound I've been trying to get. It's like that permanent waves era <coughs> rush. Oh, thing. okay. Just, I got to dig in with that then. Yeah, it's, it's, because if, if you do rate and depth like this or like this, like, one at nine, one at like 10 o'clock, one at two o'clock or vice versa, and then have okay. the mix all the way up and just add some, whatever the feedback control on there is called. It's, um, yeah, it's sort of, I've got an original CE1 here that a buddy of mine had and it's sort of like, he doesn't really play guitar much anymore. So he's like, ah, oh, just, you know, have it for safekeeping. That sounds great, but they do a CE1 copy that's like, the C1 without all the ball ache, basically, like it runs on nine volt. Um, mm. But yeah, it's the like the attention to detail. They also do an ADA flanger, which they've just come out with. Yes, she's sending me one. Oh, great. I, I, gotta check. So I can't good. wait. It's, I had asked, it's that I was sound. Like, all right, ADA flanger, cool. But can you make the chorus that is inside the ADA MP1? Yes, that would be. No one has done that. Yeah. And she said it's digital. So I, I didn't know. All uh, right, because in that it's digital, she she did, that's not her wheelhouse. She's all analog. In that um, plugin, the ADA MP1 plugin, isn't that just like a a normal chorus rather than being like specifically the ADA chorus? Did someone make that point? Yeah, I think so. I think it's kind of like a generic chorus mm. thing. Because yeah, the ADA chorus is great, and it's because it does the <clears> thing <throat> that a lot of those eighties core i do where like the one side is phase inverted mm -hmm. so like if you have the rate all the way down the depth it does the kind of spatial expander style thing which is really really cool um on that topic while you know while we're exhausting all this stuff do you still have your tc 1210 yes i'll okay. never sell that that, yeah, that that's is amazing forever and mine is not in the best health um i borrowed michael torrens to compare and his is super clean right. mine feels like if almost like you turn the input up a little too hot still sounds great um but I, i've been trying to find someone to fix it and no one will touch it <laughs> the real bummer. Uh, i mean that's kind of like the 2290 or the eventide like i have them i got a switchblade um mm -hmm. we did a thing with charles scott 
at Bad Robot and he's like, I have this thing called the Switchblade and it's just the best thing ever because you route anything to anything else. And then Troy sent me a message like, there's one for sale in Australia and it was a great price. So I got it. And I was like, yeah, this is kind of cool. And then I got everything and I was like, no, this is amazing because you can do all the parallel stuff easily and it's all programmable and you just go like, oh, cool. I want to go from the 2290 on one patch. They even tied another patch, but I do have that thing where it's like, you know, every time you turn it on, there's that little bit of like, is it actually going to fire up this time? I know there's just going to be a time it turns on and it doesn't work and that's it. And it's sort of like there's, there'll be some part that's 30 years out of production that just won't, you won't be able to get. And that'll be sad. But, you know, at the same time, there's sort of modern stuff, which is. You just have to cherish the time you have with it, you know, it's, it's exactly. Okay. And then exactly. you can I'll still it. keep it in my rack, though. Like, yeah, hundred percent. It's just the coolest looking thing ever. And you yeah, yeah. the touch, like the touchpad on there mm -hmm. for entering. It has a stuff. specific feel. Da, 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 da. Big time. Um, all right, we have absolutely yabbered on and used up so much of your time. Is there, you know, do you have any any advice for the the gear conscious or gear crazy out there? Any any what what would you say is like? If you could meet yourself back when you were green and, uh, you know, talking about John Sykes on the internet before working with them, um, to anybody who's like getting into playing guitar or doing audio stuff, like what's the best piece of advice you've ever had or learned by experience? I, I don't get? know, but I, I think it's just like, don't close yourself off. Like there's a lot of music I don't like, but I even if I don't like it, I, I have this compulsion to figure out why I don't like it and why someone else would like it. And then that's cool. Once I figure that out, I don't need to listen to it again, but like, don't turn yourself off to that mm. stuff. Cause there's a lot to learn in, uh, everywhere. Would you almost say that like by figuring out what you don't like about something, it helps you tune in better to what you do like when you're trying to make music or other things like yeah i think it just informs like, you yeah like you have a bigger vocab musical vocabulary or sonic vocabulary to work from i think so i think that's pretty good advice all righty ladies and gentlemen thank you for tuning into the gear podcast the amazing michael nielsen will definitely have to have you back official friend of the podcast yes yeah i feel yeah. like we just started talking about exactly stuff. exactly oh, where can people find you on the internet michael uh, you can find my YouTube page. It's actually uh, Michael Nielsen or Big Harry Guitars. Easy enough to find. Uh, Michael Nielsen Music <clears throat> is my website. Um, I'm going to start putting out uh, music, like trying to do a solo album. It's very slow going. but Because you put point, out a single recently, right? Yeah. So that I have some music on um, Spotify and stuff, and I'll put more up as soon as I get some time to do that. But yeah, it's coming along. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, man. Thank you very much. Thank you again very Yeah, soon. thanks for having me, guys. It was a blast. And uh, to everybody watching, thank you for watching and listening to the Gear Podcast. We'll see you next week. Peace.